This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with Will Getzman, who is a professor at the Yale School of Management and also the author of a bunch of fantastic books, including uh, these two that I have right here with me. One is called Money Changes Everything, How Finance Made Civilization Possible. And then this other book, The Origins of Value, uh, The Financial Innovations That Created Modern Capital Markets. Well, Will, you know, this is a bold claim that you make, uh, how finance made civilization possible. And I'm, I'm going to expect you to, to defend that claim. I think it's a little bit more controversial for someone other than myself, because I, I've, I've studied financial history and taught financial history. And so, of course, to me, this sounds perfectly obvious. But to people, um, you know, outside of, of financial history, they might wonder, you know, how this could possibly be true. And so, in addition to asking you to justify that claim, the, the other question I would have for you to start things off is, we, we all know about kind of history of science departments, right? Every university has people who do history of, of science, uh, but the history of science focuses on things like the discovery of the planets and the invention of the steam engine. And yet you consistently refer to financial technology in your book. And, you know, when we think of the term fintech today, we think about, uh, oh, wow, that's, you know, technology plus finance. But you argue that finance itself is uh, a technology. And perhaps, you know, if we're studying history of science, we should be studying the history of, of finance just as much. So I want to know, why hasn't finance been thought of as a, a technology? Why hasn't law been thought of as, as a technology? And how might we kind of professionalize this field of, of financial history and give it uh, a place at the table along with the folks who study the history of physics and the history of, you know, engineering and so forth? Well, those two questions are big orders to uh, address in <laughs> just uh, one response. Um, I will we can say, have two. I will say, I was motivated to write the book because um, a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, who are not financial economists um, regarded finance as a kind of a peculiar um, feature of uh, the very wealthy and uh, more of an instrument uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of extraction uh, rather than uh, a way to get things done. And so my interest has always been in finance. You know, what does it mean to have this, these sets of tools, these ways of doing things? Um, and particularly, what does it mean to society as a whole? So, um, <clears throat> Is it a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Is it an in-between thing? So that's sort of the framework uh, for the kind of historical quest. Um, and as I was working on the book, uh, I really kind of started with, well, what was the earliest corporation and, and when did people first start to take account of the time value money? And I began to understand that those things are fundamental to um, dealing with the complexities of society. Um, to make a long story short, in order to, to, to plan ahead and also to make decisions about in the, in the present that will affect the future, you have to have this, this framework of time and tools that move money back and forth. And one of those tools is a loan. So uh, the book starts with uh, the very earliest urban civilizations. Um, in Mesopotamia and shows how um, these tools for planning, uh, for lending, for borrowing, for financing were used not just for um, what you might think of as capitalist enterprise, which would be merchant trading and so forth, but used pervasively by the society to construct promises and deliveries that would make it possible for a lot of people to live in a city that weren't farmers, but still needed to be able to plan how to get, um, you know, consumer goods and things like that. So that's sort of the basic idea. And you can imagine all of the, 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 the innovations since then as our, our urban society has developed increasingly 
um, uh, c- complex ways uh, of um, of growing and thriving. And the book gives a lot of examples uh, about how um, an innovation, a financial innovation, might have changed the uh, capacity uh, of a culture um, to uh, grow and thrive. Yeah, I mean, I think people often talk about finance as being distinct from kind of the the real economy, right? And when people talk about financiers, they're they're thinking about people who are, you know, I, I standing outside of the the real business, and uh, you know whether they're viewed as parasites by by certain people or or, or viewed you know merely as um, you know speculators by by other people. They they don't see it as an, an essential technology that makes everything else uh, possible. And I think part of the historical context is to is to you know show how you know without those financial innovations you wouldn't be able to do all of the other things that make for prosperity. Yes, you know um, when you look at wires in your home, um, they don't clean the floor, they don't uh, clean the dishes, they don't actually light up anything. Mm-hmm. They're connection tool, they're connection devices, but you couldn't have an electrified home without the wires. I think of finance as the wiring system, the plumbing system. It's not a uh, an end in itself. It's a cofactor in all of the things that we as a society uh, want to do. Um, and so it's easy to get uh, focused on this medium of doing things, which mm-hmm. is the finance and for that matter, money. Um, and uh, forget that, um, you know, without a financial structure, we wouldn't be able to deliver most of the social services that that uh, society delivers. Um, and um, so that's that's the simple logic of it, um, that finance shouldn't be considered a, uh, a strange stratospheric thing that has no connection to uh, t- to productive activity. Um, Another example, farmers um, plant now and then they sow, uh, you know, when the crop, co- you know, they, they sow now and then they reap when the crop comes in. Mm-hmm. But in order to be able to do something that's so separated in time, they have to have a way of financing themselves before that crop uh, uh, gives them some, some, uh, some cash. That's finance. Um, uh, so, um, you know, that's, that's, that, that's the simple notion uh, that the book uh, presents. Yeah, I was speaking to another uh, guest and was talking about, you know, for animals, uh, if you want to uh, help them understand cause and effect, you have this almost like 90 second window in which you can, you have to have the, 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 the reinforcing reinforcement take place. Um, and, and so the idea that you could plant something in, in one season and, and, you know, harvest it six months later is something that other animals, you know, if it's not hardwired, they're never going to figure it out. Uh, I think one of your your points is that that finance has shaped how we think about time, and you mentioned the three hundred and sixty day, you know, financial year, and and how that that lines up with some of the astrological years that that people were using. Um, but we always talk about the we always talk about the astrological folks, presumably because they left behind a physical reminder of what they were doing. And, and at the beginning of the book, you mentioned that, you know, finance has, finance doesn't leave behind quite the same record as other uh, human endeavors, right? Um, that the archaeology of finance is a little bit more limited. And so you kind of walk through all the different discoveries of how, you know, we're able to reverse engineer some of the, the, the contractual forms and, and corporate forms. Now, Mesopotamia was more generous with, with, with physical objects. When I, I teach my, I teach a course where uh, on the first day we talk about the history of, of money and I highlight that, you know, most of the cuneiform tablets, when the archeologists found them, they were hoping to get, you know, myths and, and legends and, you know, all this other fun stuff. And what they found was, Hey, this guy, you know, gives three sheep to this guy and stuff like that. It, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not quite as interesting to anyone who's not a, not a finance person. Yeah, you know, um, in some sense, uh, writing down business contracts may be necessary because it it wouldn't otherwise stick in your head. You mm-hmm. know, the, the the story of Gilgamesh and all the adventures and so forth; those are things that probably could be passed down and remembered in some form 
because they're just fascinating and, and, and a great narrative. Um, but the uh, early clay tablets that probably stretch back, well, probably more than 3000 uh, BCE, um, you know, those things have this prosaic nature that they, uh, they just are, 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 are quantitative records about promises um, and then the deliveries, um, really just kind of accounting records. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the book itself, um, you know, starts really with that, those first urban societies. But we also know that, you know, tens of thousands of years before those, uh, people were keeping records of some sort on pieces of bone. And those records probably had to do with the passage of the seasons, with the phases of the moon, um, and, and the kinds of things that would um, help the um, uh, hunter and gatherer societies to get uh, to do economic planning um, mm. uh, uh, around the seasons. Um, you know, we don't know for sure because they didn't leave any written records. They just left mm. little notational things with pictures of animals and so forth. But um, you know, this 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 notion that you need a notational system in order to organize yourself in time and plan uh, for the future uh, is is something that's quite an exciting um feature uh, uh, of the human mind and the human society so anyway i left all that out of the book um mm. so when the book uh, starts up we're at the beginning of written uh, beginning of the origins of writing uh which comes as a result of the need to keep these records so mm -hmm. people didn't invite the writing wasn't invented to write down these great epic stories it was invented to keep a, a track of who owes what. Well, when we think about the invention of money, right? I mean, you know, keep, record keeping and money are, are distinct, uh, right? I mean, if you're in a small community, you can sort of just use ledger entries to kind of keep track of kind of who, who owes what to whom. But you, you reference Aristotle's view of where kind of money came from. And, and I think it's a little bit different from the, the Menger story, the Carl Menger story that we all hear where it originated in, in small communities. Aristotle believes that there was no need for money uh, until we started interacting with, with strangers. And then we needed some kind of, you know, physical uh, token, which would allow for kind of intertemporal uh, exchange. And, and, and so I think a lot of people were very skeptical about Aristotle's view, but I think you, you, you say that maybe there's something to that. Uh, yes, this, this question of where did, physical money come from is interesting. Of course, right now, for those of us that have Bitcoin wallets, uh, you know, uh, that, that part of our wealth is certainly simply a matter of accounting, as is most of our kind of um, investment in, um, uh, in uh, mutual funds and, and uh, that kind of thing. So we right now have managed to almost entirely um, divorce our modern urban life from the use of these physical tokens that we call coins. But, but yet now uh, we have coins, more, there's, there's more hundred dollar bills, I think outstanding right now than ever in, in history. And those, those little, I, when you were writing about the Athenian owls, right. I, I was thinking that those were like the, the Benjamins of their day, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the point you bring up is fascinating that the growth of U S currency uh, exceeds the growth rate of of global of the global economy. Like why why is that? That's an interesting kind of uh, problem, because money is nothing more than the uh, than the, the the liquid factor that makes mm -hmm. the allows the economy to grow. So you sort of think it should grow at about the same rate, but apparently, uh, lately American uh, the U.S. currency has has is in higher demand than than um, we can model. Um, yes, this, this idea of, of money, the, the physical invention of money, that was a technological innovation. And I, you know, will never know, but I think that money like that was necessary when you had people that would come from another place and you might never see them again, but you wanted to interact with them economically. So a sailor shows up on your dock somewhere in uh, um, what's modern day Turkey, uh, wants to trade for things, wants to hang out for a few weeks, wants to pay for a hotel and 
and get some food, um, you know, that sailor may climb on a boat and sink later on. Yeah. So this is this is a kind of a tool that allows you to um, to sell him things and let him let him buy things, um, uh, you know, with an intermediary uh, device that was interestingly enough, it's memoryless. You know, mm -hmm. once the coin goes from one person to the other, you know, there's no blockchain record of the history of that coin. Uh, so people say, you know, people talk about dirty money, but uh, once it, it passes from one hand to the other, nobody really understands, you know, whether it was dirty or not. Uh, every, every Benjamin Franklin looks the same uh, to, to, to somebody with, with it in their wallet. Well, what was interesting, you, know, you were talking about the power of Athens, and and later, of course, it pops up in a bunch of other uh, locales, but that, you know, Athens gained its its power not just because they controlled the creation of these silver coins, but also because they had the most advanced kind of legal system and court system. And it reminded me, I mean, today, you know, in law, we have choice of forum, choice of law. And, you know, if you're, if you're doing a contract in, in, in Russia, some, let's say maybe, you know, you'll, you'll choose to have English law in a Swiss court or something like that. And so, you know, today we think about Delaware and everything happens in, in Delaware. It seems like Athens was, was like the, the, the Delaware plus the, you know, Geneva plus London plus New York all in one for that entire region. Yes, that's something I kind of learned while I was doing research for the book. Um, I, my my thoughts of Athens were, you know, amazing classical architecture and um, and uh, the origins of democracy. But what was interesting is to see that the the economic and financial infrastructure underneath all of that, and sometimes the clash between the the uh, philosophers and, and, and the uh, merchants and, and, and the merchant law. But there's a very simple idea that you could sue people in court about a financial loss or a financial fraud um, is really interesting. Um, you know, I mean, Athens wasn't the first place where these kinds of lawsuits took place. Uh, uh, we do know in the Middle East that uh, on these cuneiform documents, uh, that there were lawsuits that extended over years and do, and, 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 and so forth. But for Athens, the thing that was amazing was that these are, many of them were about voyages that had great risk associated with mm -hmm. them. Uh, and uh, those voyages had to be undertaken because that's how Athenians got their food. Uh, mm -hmm. They couldn't grow enough grain locally to support their population. So they depended crucially on these um, these maritime trade, these seafaring trade contracts, and um, enforcing them uh, was much more important than trying to give one person or another uh, some kind of temporary advantage. Yeah, when I um, you start the book by explaining what finance is, and I use the same language I use when I do my introductory finance class. You know, you teach people have already had economics, and there are yeah, we understand what bargaining is, we understand what trade is. Okay, what's different about finance. And of course it's, you know, it's the economics of time and it's the economics of, of risk. And it's about how you shift these things around in ways that expand the, the contracting space, right. Uh, across time and across individuals. Um, but the, 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 the interesting thing about your chapter on Athens was that most of these contractual disputes were um, adjudicated by juries. And sometimes these juries had 500 people and they're able to follow the ins and outs. Now, today, when you do complex litigation, right, there's complex tort cases or whatever. You know, if you do it in front of a jury, um, you've got to bring in a lot of experts to do testimony. And even then, most jurors will admit that they have absolutely no clue what's going on. And they'll typically, you know, rule in favor of whoever seemed to have the, the, the smoothest baritone voice, right, as, as an expert uh, witness. Um, so, you know, how is it that these ordinary Athenians, I mean, did, the, did was this part of being an Athenian? Did you have to understand uh, how these contracts worked and how these journeys worked and how these different organizational forms worked? Was this just sort of part, part of what you learned? I mean, in today's world, if you, do we need to, you know, incorporate into high school, teach people? Because most people don't get 
you know, ninety nine percent of the population probably doesn't doesn't get very far down the road in finance in, in in the U.S. And even I wouldn't trust my MBA students to sit on a jury if it was a you know a, a, a complex CDO squared transaction, right? So how do they do this? You know, that is to me that's one of the most interesting things about Athens. Uh, that the average level of understanding of an, of an economic argument, a financial argument, was really high among jurors, and yet the jurors were drawn uh, from the citizen, c- citizenry. Um, so I'm pondering that myself, but I, I have a couple of uh, th- th- theories about it. One is the juries were so big that everybody ended up sitting on a jury at some point and probably more than once. And so it, it, you kind of, over your lifetime, you trained up uh, through exposure to these these arguments. And also, if you have 500 people that are just told a story about one person cheating another, you know, mm. they'll walk away the next day talking about it, gossiping about it, arguing about it. And so, you know, it introduces these topics into popular discourse mm-hmm. in a way that, um, you know, uh, today's, um, you know, social media or today's um, television media might do. So that's that's one thought. The other thing is you only had to sit for one day on a jury. So, I mean, everybody could spare one day to listen to a, a, an interesting argument. Uh, so it was not, it probably wasn't onerous. Plus they paid you to do it. Um, and uh, so that was another big benefit. So, um, you know, I think, you know, might have been part of the entertainment uh, of being an Athenian citizen Mm -hmm. um, that kind of hooked you into uh, learning more about it. (laughs) I can't I can't imagine like a a a reality TV show that that focused on, you know, the the disputes (laughs) over, you know, complex corporate contracts today. Um, Yeah, I mean, there were. You know, in those arguments, um, they didn't always use logical uh, arguments. They used mm. ad hominem attacks. They called people. Mm. They said, you're going to believe this foreigner uh, when he tells you this story. This guy is from someplace else. So they, they would use these mm-hmm. crude um, these these crude um, rhetorical devices as well. They, uh, and um, so, you know, one of the one of the great legal minds, Demosthenes, could be found taking uh, in uh, two different sides on the same uh, case uh, Mm -hmm. through time. Uh, So, um, you know, it was not a matter of ethics. It was a matter of crafting a a, a powerful uh, legal uh, argument um, and uh, not necessarily always the most logical. Yeah, I think the interesting thing about that is that, you know, when you think about, well, what did Athens export? I mean... Okay, they exported silver, but really they exported this kind of expertise. They they exported um, uh, legal technology and and financial technology, right? Uh, in in by having all of these disputes take place in in Athens. Now, when you move on to Rome, a lot of people um, talk. I mean, there's a famous quote by I forget who it was that said that the most important invention in history was. The limited liability corporation. I think whoever said that was saying it tongue in cheek, but when they referenced it, they they weren't thinking past the probably the 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 joint stock companies of the 18th century. And you you go back and and show that in fact, you know, well, uh, you you reference Ul- Ulrika Malmendier, my colleague's work, but you you talk about how um, you know we had something like limited liability in in ancient Rome, and and not just sort of the publicani, but you talk about the um this, this, this slave relationship, right. And how, um, you know, by sponsoring a, a slave, you could effectively separate your, your ownership from control. Could, could you talk a bit about that? Cause that, that was something I found fascinating. I, I hadn't, I've seen books on, on how slave ownership in the modern times has, uh, essentially inspired labor law and, and, um, you know, uh, workplace liability laws and so forth. But this, this was something that I found it very, very interesting. Well, yeah, this is a curious thing that, um, that came up. I didn't really know much about it until I started working on it. Um, one of the most interesting features of it is it starts in Athens actually, which is the first banks that, uh, appear in history, um, 
the way that they uh, extended beyond the lifetime of the of the of the banker um, was a succession, not from let's say father to son, but um, through a, 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 a the relationship between the the banker and a slave who then once the banker um, retired or died, the slave um, would become uh, the banker, inherit the the bank um, and uh, maintain it. So um, you sort of wonder how could that happen? We have this idea, uh, you know, uh, rightly so of, of slavery as ex exploitation. Mm -hmm. um, but um, when you come to Rome, you also have this example of of uh, uh, of a of, of a slave inheriting uh, and perpetuating a, a business, particularly a financial business. So why is that? Well, you think about banking as a very specialized uh, toolkit and a craft that takes a long time to learn. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, have a relationship where uh, somebody is bound to somebody else. That means they're human. Well, it's like a non compete. It's, it's a non compete. It's basically a non compete, right? Yeah, that's one. That's an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, the person's bound; they can't start their own bank. And you teach them an enormous amount, but um, yeah, they, 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 that knowledge belongs and is uh, belongs to you. Uh, so. Um, yeah, in a non-compete agreement, you know, we find that really distasteful because we believe in the, the personal freedom to, uh, you know, to use the knowledge that you've acquired. Um, but that idea took a long time uh, to uh, evolve, I think. But this idea that so the, the aristocrats were not allowed to engage in commerce, right? They're only allowed to own land. And so the way in which they were able to kind of get involved in commerce was to, you know, have these these slaves do all the work and then they could sort of pretend like they weren't weren't involved. And so they wouldn't be held accountable for any of the liabilities that were incurred by the by the slave. Is that right? Yeah. So um, the real way it would work uh, would be that. Um, uh you wouldn't if you were a senator and or a, a member of a, the real upper class. Uh, you really couldn't get your hands dirty. The law prevented you, as a matter of fact, from getting your hands dirty through doing uh, being an active merchant. Um, so you would have a uh, a slave who did all of this business. The law, Roman law at that time said, well, if you have a slave that's doing what you just told them to do, and it results in, let's say, the death of a uh, of a uh, uh, of a cow. Then you have to uh, you have to pay the farmer for that cow, but if you simply give the slave general instructions like, uh, "I want you to manage my uh, my herd," um, those um, and and then the slave makes a decision without you knowing that results in the death mm -hmm. of the cow, then you're not responsible. So that's limited liability for the uh, for for the asset owner. It's like, it's like it's like the in LP. The if you're, you're basically an LP, right? You're, you're kind of like an LP, but yes, but, but not. Yeah. So you, you wind up getting the upside, big portion of the upside, but then your, your downside is, is limited. Yes, that's right. As long as you say to your, the, the real manager of the company uh, who's enslaved to you, as long as you say, look, you run this, do a good job. Yeah. And uh, eventually you're going to end up inheriting it. Um, you know, there's some incentive to that, particularly when, um, you know, the slave was also able to uh, earn assets and so forth on their own. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk about the farming, right? The Pubacani, and this is sort of the public administrative duties that were kind of handed out to to the private private sector. And, you know, this, this is something which reappears over and over again, uh, certainly later in the book when you talk about the chartered companies. Um, and, and you talk about how, you know, the emergence of the bureaucracy in ancient Rome kind of put, put an, put an end to this. Um, I think people, there's, you know, people are sometimes talking about how privatization today is, is, is something which, uh, is, is always going to lead to better results. But, but I think the history of, 
kind of outsourcing public administration is, is a little bit more mixed. Could, could you talk a bit about, you know, what you saw, saw there, both in ancient Rome and in, you know, more modern times? Sure. Um, you know, the way I looked at the, the, these early um, corporations in Rome, well, most of what I learned, I learned from Ulrika Malmadir. Uh, so, um, you, you know, uh, I, I met her early in her career and, and uh, read everything she could write about these Roman companies. So um, me, most of these ideas are really hers. But um, I was interested in the kind of bigger picture of the role they played in Roman society. Um, and, uh, you know, Roman society, it Rome itself grew rather rapidly. And uh, the argument she makes is, it grew so rapidly that um, they had to privatize certain activities like uh, provisioning of the armies and, and collection of taxes and so forth because they just couldn't build the bureaucracy fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then when Rome got to be imperial Rome, of course, uh, everything turned around and, um, and it, it, it built this vast bureaucracy and the privatization uh, withered um, yeah, and eventually disappeared. So this is the kind of trajectory that, that comes from her work. What I think is interesting is that when you have a society where most of the people uh, can actually own shares mm -hmm. in productive businesses, you are sharing equity. You are spreading the wealth. You are letting everybody participate in this amazing economic growth of Rome. And so I, I sort of thought of these companies and the selling of shares not as exploitative, but as a necessary condition for a lot of Romans to buy in to mm -hmm. what became a, a very militaristic uh, uh, society. And, um, you know, if, if you're going to pay for maintaining an outpost on the uh, border between what's now England and Scotland, uh, you're kind of wondering what's in it for you, but if you're able to buy into some of the economic benefits through owning shares in a company, well, you know, you might be more willing to see that happen. Well, when you when you fast forward to, to Venice and you talk about Monte Vecchio, I mean, it's, it's sort of a similar concept. It's a different type of instrument, but the idea that the citizenry is, is sort of uh, aligned with the preservation of the state, right? Um, and, and I think that was kind of the, the insight that, that Alexander Hamilton had, right, at the formation of, of the United States, which was to, you know, make sure that the, the financial interests were the people who had the ability to influence things were, you know, their interests were aligned with the, with the preservation and strengthening of, of the state. Well, you're making these amazing leaps through time and space. Um, one way you could break down different kinds of governments um, along the along the fault line of um, of finance would be to, to look at some of the uh, city states that emerged in Europe as uh, merchant driven, merchant owned, merchant controlled. So Venice was very much uh, the case. It was a, a great trading um, republic for I guess eight hundred years or more, um, but Amsterdam, Holland uh, had those kinds of uh, cities where the merchants ran the, they ran the cities. And mm -hmm. so a lot of the things, the, 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 the financial structures and banks and, and, um, and financing tools um, were protected by the ruling um, merchant class. But you could look at other societies where, um, like um, France would be a good example, where um, you know, the king was uh, was primary in terms of 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 governance and ass assigning rights to different groups of people. So to get ahead in France, you had to see if there's a, there was a way to uh, curry favor with Louis XIV and hang out in his new playground. Um, you know, uh, as it was going, that was as it was being constructed in, in Versailles. Um, and, uh, you know, you had to make friends so that you could get one of these special tax farming contracts and so mm -hmm. forth. And um, some people think that retarded the growth of, of financial technology um, because, of course, uh, rulers um, uh, play to a different crowd than merchants. They have different mm -hmm. uh, goals. And so um, 
you know, you see different kinds of financial arrangements uh, cropping up uh, in, in, in these two different kinds of political organizations. Yeah, I forget where it was when you 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 said that the concept of opportunity cost of capital was was invented, right? Because people, I, th I think one of the kind of themes that goes through the book is that, you know, a lot of people find it easy to think about, all right, um, you know, you, you give me a piece of land, I get the income from the land, or you give me a cow and I get the calves that, that you know, come from uh, the cow, or if, you, you know, if you, you, you give me a, a job, I get the income from the job, but, but, you know, the abs basically creating some abstract notion of what you could be earning if you, you know, had this, this, this money in your possession, that was something which was sort of fundamentally new, right? Uh, it required a leap of the imagination, which, which kind of freed, freed finance from this, this idea of, you know, physical possession of, of collateral. Uh, yeah. In the Middle Ages, you think of this feudal society where, uh, you know, the duke or something has a castle, then, then, then leases out or, or allows people to, um, to, to occupy the fields and then pay, uh, uh, pay for the privilege. Um, you know, the contracting structure that emerged from that was, you know, the duke could actually, uh, borrow some money or take some money in advance mm -hmm. for the right to use the land for, let's say, two years. That same concept, could, people figured out you could do the same thing, only not with land. You didn't need the mm -hmm. land. You say, look, you give me money now, I'll pay you back later. You didn't have to identify some uh, collateral or cash flow or, say, grain flow in order to, mm -hmm. um, to justify that. And that, you're right, the way you described it is, it kind of frees up finance from a one-to-one -one connection with physical assets or, or, or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned how the word for interest in all these different languages was tied to, to cattle and, and, and cows. Um, and, and, you know, it makes you wonder whether the, you know, finance had sort of a leg up in, in societies that, that had these domesticated animals. One of the big parts of your book is about China and kind of the, the divergence between China and, and the West. Um, and I found this, I think this part is something that most, even people who are familiar with financial history are, are usually not super well educated about China. How did you get interested in the Chinese story? And, and did you find doing research in, in the Chinese story more, more difficult than in the, in the West? Well, I got interested in China. Um, through a few different ways. Um, uh, one of them, somebody asked me to write a paper about um, bonds in China, and I just said yes, and that got me thinking about it. But, um, you know, with China, we have this wonderful opportunity to study the evolution of a financial system, an economic system that wasn't completely divorced, but mostly separated from Europe. So you, you can develop economic theories based upon, let's say, the emergence of corporations in Great Britain, but you don't know what pa what's the other path not taken until you look at a society like China that had all of these sophisticated cultural features and civilizational characteristics, but um, lacked um, what we think of as the modern pub publicly held corporation. So that was a kind of, an, it, that was a, a prod to an economist to say that if there are fundamental economic principles, they ought to show up in both of these two very different mm -hmm. settings. Um, so um, uh, I got interested in, in China in two different ways. One of them was, uh, as I said, through China's use of modern capital markets in the 19th century to very quickly leap forward after mm -hmm. um, a, a period of, 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 let's call it, economic stagnation and exploitation. Uh, and the other one was, you know, just as we have political philosophers and economic philosophers like Aristotle in Greece, we also see that there were similar kinds of philosophers in China at the same time, thinking very much about the role of money in society and um, the, uh, the how the ruler would use financial tools, uh, both to provide benefits um, but also extract value from the populace. Um, I'll add one more thing about China, uh, which is 
when you study these long-term uh, forces in China, the, the push and pull between, uh, b between the emperor uh, and the merchants, uh, you see a, a really regular process of merchants being allowed to develop new, new ideas, new techniques, new methods, new technologies. And then the government comes along eventually and, and, and takes, the benef takes those benefits away. Mm -hmm. Right now with China, uh, people are worried about what's happening with um, the government taking the, yeah. the, 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 the tech companies and so forth. And, and I see it as something that um, one might have expected if you believed in the continuity uh, of the Chinese tradition. Yeah, one of the things you highlight is that, you know, this is an argument that's made by a bunch of uh, historians, that kind of the fragmentation of Europe was a stimulus to innovation, right? Uh, and, you know, the, the mobility of capital, the fact that, you know, if, if, if one uh, ruler was, was uh, in behaving opportunistically, that capital would, would flee and move to another jurisdiction. Um, and China, you didn't have that, that possibility. Um, that seems to be a big, big part of your story, sort of in the background. Um, yeah, the, the, the crux I try and I don't know whether it's the only thing, but it's an important thing, um, uh, is the invention of the bond market and the ability of uh, the Venetian government and other Italian governments soon thereafter uh, to, um, to issue debt, uh, collect money up front, and then fight wars. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, use that to, to, to um, send an army off to, uh, you know, conquer their neighbors. Um, in China, uh, it didn't seem to have that kind of structure for a long time, not until uh, probably the 19th century is when you, you, you see China actually doing things like issuing government uh, debt. Mm -hmm. So that seemed to be a salient difference um, that was a financial technology. And it depended as much on the... Uh, the immediate needs of governments to uh, wage local wars and uh, the actual weakness and, and, and lack of a vast treasury that, like the kind that Athens had. Um, uh, and it, 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 that really led to them getting into debt all over the place and in different ways. And actually, weirdly enough, investors figured out that that was a benefit to them. They could they could hold the promises of lots of different states, diversify internationally, mm -hmm. even though it was all within the little enclosed area of Europe, um, and uh, it, you know to profit from these um, uh, from these internecine battles. Now there are a couple of really cool things that I learned in this book. You know, a lot of times when in my classes I talk about how you know the average life expectancy of a corporation is really short nowadays, and it's getting shorter and shorter. And and then I challenge the students to come up with a company that's been around for more than you know a hundred years or so. And every now and then someone will mention the Hudson Bay Company, or you know maybe they'll get clever and say the Bank of England. But you you highlighted a couple really interesting entities in the book. One was the 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 kind of mills in uh, Toulouse. And then the other was these uh, kind of dam maintenance entities in, in Holland. And you recount the story of going to try and collect on one of these perpetual ponds that was issued in the 1600s uh, that is in the possession of the, uh, of the Yale uh, Beinecke Library. Could, could you kind of recount those stories for me? Yeah, sure. Uh, they're both really, um, they're both really interesting because they connect it exact places that you could still visit. So, you know, finance being this dimension of time, um, there is a bond uh, that was issued in 1648 um, by a Dutch water company. And the water company was in charge of building dikes and dams. Uh, why? Because if you didn't have somebody maintaining those, doesn't matter what the other governments are, you know, uh, Spanish or, or, or Belgian or whatever, uh, you have to figure out a way to keep those in shape or else the whole country is going to flood. So that company uh, that existed in 1648, it had existed in some form since about the 13th century, but um, they issued some bonds to fix a little um, piece of something called cribbing in a curve in a river, uh, the River Lek. And if you go on um, Google Earth, you can zoom down 
and see the curve on the river, you can see the little bit of cribbing that's been replaced since 1648, but it's all still there. And the company's still there. Yale uh, was able to buy at an auction uh, this one of a, I don't know, maybe a handful to 20 of these bonds that are still outstanding and they still pay an annual interest to the bondholders. So now when you walk when you walked in there and asked for your money, what did I'm sure you know? The, I, mean, I mean, I guess they were expecting you, but but you know, it can't be a regular uh, occurrence uh, over there. Well, I have to confess, it wasn't me. It was my colleague Geert Rowenhorst, mm -hmm. and he's uh, so he is from Holland, from the Netherlands, and so he walked in there and and uh, uh, you know he could have been a uh, local bondholder. Uh, and um, so the first time it was a, well, actually we've done it twice. We let the interest accrue until it pays for the cost of a trip over there. We bring in the document um, uh, uh, with the bond uh, claim on it. And um, then we tell them in advance because Dutch TV comes in and films the whole thing. This company <laughs> is very proud to pay us this bit of money because it's a sign who else can claim that they've been paying off their bonds, you know, for 500 years or 400 years. I mean, that's, that's like a great thing. So mm -hmm. anyway, it makes the news, uh, and every decade or so, um, somebody goes over last time it was our, uh, our, uh, uh, a Beinecke librarian who is, who's also our, our sometime collaborator on this research. Mm -hmm. Well, so you have a background, before you got into finance, you have a background in art history. And I want to hear a bit about, you know, how you um, made the decision to switch from art history to operations research to to finance. Um, and, and whether you, you think that that was a, a, a discontinuous move or, or were you sort of layering on kind of expertise? How many times do you think you're leaning on your art historical insight when you're standing up there teaching a course on alternative investments, <laughs> unless you're, unless you're doing those, you know, those, those, unless you're talking about those funds that, that buy art. And, um, and I know there are some of those out there right now that, that allow you to invest in, in art. Well, um, uh, I've always had an omnivorous curiosity, uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps uncontrolled. And so in some sense, I followed, uh, opportunities. Uh, as opposed to having a, 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 a one goal in life. And, and uh, so, you know, there's a whole spectrum of different kinds of people. I'm one that, uh, that, that has done lots of different kinds of things, some of them successfully, some of them less so. Um, but yes, I did have a career in the arts um, and um, had great fun uh, doing that and career in filmmaking and so forth. But, um, you know, I was really inspired by one uh, teacher, or actually two of them at the Yale School of Management. One of them is uh, Stephen Ross, who has passed away, but one of the giants of modern finance. Another, John Ingersoll, who's my colleague here now. Um, and for some reason, um, you know, it was a little bit like uh, my fair lady situation. They said, let's see if we can take this person who's coming from the arts and, and train them up to be a financial economist. Uh, so, um, it's you like know, my fair I mean, lady, right? This is, this is like I'm sorry, reverse. my fair lady. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's that's my backstory. Uh, but I tell you, I still really am interested in what is art, what's the economic logic of it, why do people need to own it? Um, and so um, I, right now, a current project I, I'm doing with my co-authors is studying um, non-fungible tokens, mm -hmm. NFTs, um, because. Um, there are this peculiar art marketplace that just emerged suddenly, and it's like a laboratory that you can study um, all these things about the arts. You know, why do people feel like possession is so important as opposed to enjoyment, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, it's right there in this data. And um, uh, so um, I still, uh, the way I operate is to try and keep a foot in all of these different fields that I've found interesting over my career, as opposed to sort of saying, well, I've now turned a, a page and I don't care about it. Um, I try and see if there's a connection to finance. And actually, there's a connection between everything in finance if you if you scratch uh, hard enough. Yeah. And in fact, you, you 
you talk a lot about kind of probability theory and uh, and and how you know gambling uh, and understanding gambling played such a huge role in well we know it played a huge role in the development of probability theory right with Bernoulli and and uh, and others but but you also uh, talk about how important it was to finance and and there are a lot of people who are successful financiers who we might look at and call them kind of gamblers like like John Law but I guess, I guess when you're um, an expert on probability theory, it's, it's not, it's not gambling, right? It's, it's, uh, you know, you're, you you've got the deck stacked in, in your, uh, in your favor. Um, so maybe you could talk a bit about the sort of that intellectual history of, um, the role that, that, uh, gambling paid in, in played in, in the development of, um, you know, uh, the tontines and, and the, uh, the life annuities. And, and well, I was astonished that the governments for so long of England and France were sort of unwilling to listen to the folks who were uh, pointing out how they were mispricing these things. Yeah, gambling is, uh, it's funny. Um, the whole science of probability emerged in Europe, but but really not so in uh, China. Uh, so it really seemed to have been a function of public. Well, uh, did people not gamble? Did, pe did people not gamble in China? Was there there no? Well, there was a lot of gambling in China, but there was never this um, mathematical math this translation into mathematical formulas. Mm -hmm. that allowed you to be precise about uh, about risk. Um, and that's strange because, of course, gambling, they, you know, um, all of economics, all of, all, all of our enterprises are have a huge element of uncertainty. The ability to, to quantify that is really valuable. Now, I mean, we know that people quantified it um, approximately for long periods, you know, back to ancient Greece. But um, in the uh, in the 1600s uh, in Europe, there was a revolution in probability mathematics, and um, it, it really began with the insight that it, it, you could take two pair of two dice and roll them, and you could enumerate all the different outcomes, you know, doubles, double ones, double sixes. But in addition, you could tell how many times each one of those came up. How rare was it to get double ones or double sixes? And that allowed just being able to count those things out and put probabilities on the outcomes. It seems so simple now, but it was not something that people really were able to do much. And then being able to manipulate that mathematically could allow you to do things like figure out if you were going to write a, a life let's just say a life insurance contract um, to be able to figure out what's the probability that somebody might die within the next five years and then you'd have to pay off to their heirs. Um, and so um, the governments in Europe uh, were writing contracts that were life annuity contracts, which is sort of like our social security system. You know, we get, uh, you, re you know, after age 65 or something like that, we can start collecting social security until we die. Well, the government's got to have some way of figuring out how much money that's going to take to pay off. That means they have to understand the probability of me surviving and a lot of people like me surviving. Okay, so Europe was doing this very early, writing these life annuity contracts that's selling them so they could get money to go fight some wars or other things. And, um, you know, some of the governments... Uh, didn't listen to the mathematicians who said, wait a minute, you're pricing these things way too low. People are going to live longer than you think. Mm -hmm. You know, if you price Social Security too low, um, then the government's going to go bankrupt you, you, or you'd have to change the contract. So well, I, would love how, I would love how they would find these, uh, you know, young girls who had, you know, recovered from smallpox, and, you know, and, and buy life annuities on, on their lives, right? And, and package them and, and securitize them. I mean, that's, yeah. that's another story that I, I, I learned about, which was the securitization, which is, you know, I also have taught courses on securitization and how far back it goes, this idea of kind of packaging and bundling and, and how the Dutch had really, you know, figured out ways to, to, to draw up these complex 
bundling contracts and how it had enabled the financing of things like, you know, the peopling of Western New York. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a, you know, once you have the basic logic uh, of finance, which is uh, one of them is if it pays off and has exactly the same risk characteristics, then it has to sell for the same price. Mm-hmm. Or diversification, you bundle a bunch of things together and you can get a better idea, a better prediction of what the average will be. Those basic insights allow you, allow you to think about mixing and matching and, and combining things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, what we think of a securitization now um, basically goes back to some Dutch bankers in the, um, in the, in the uh, 1700s. And um, they figured out that they could uh, take a whole bunch of contracts like bonds that were written by, let's say, the, the, Danish, uh, uh, the Danish toll system and the bridges in, in, in Italy and so forth. All these bonds that are issued, they could bundle them up into a portfolio, just like a mutual fund, mm-hmm. and then sell shares against them. And the people that bought the shares might not have been able to afford each one of those individual bonds separately, but they were able to hold a diversified portfolio. Um, and, and so therefore some level of risk was being mitigated. But um, you know, you, that's just one kind of securitization. The other kind of securitization, it, 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 which you mentioned, is to take these life annuity contracts from all on, off, you know, 100 different people and then bundle them together and write a security against them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and then take a cut, which is what the bankers were doing. Um, but that, that insight from the, from the 18th century um, created the first um, uh, serious sort of securitizations and investment banks and, and, and so forth that we, the, that we have with us today. So when you're teaching finance, and I know most of the time you're teaching courses in, uh, you know, just standard financial courses, and then you have a financial history course that you kind of do in addition, when you're teaching sort of a regular finance class, how important is it, do you think, or how useful is it, do you think, for people studying finance to to know a bit about financial history? I mean, you know, when you're studying biology, you don't go back and, and you know, Read, read Darwin, but you definitely go back and understand what single-celled organisms, you know, were, were like. Um, do you think it's helpful? I mean, I certainly found it helpful. I, I found it very difficult to understand, you know, uh, macroeconomics without understanding money and banking. And I found it very difficult to understand money and banking until I understood like very, very rudimentary things like how goldsmiths operated and, and, uh, and then, you know, building on those simpler forms allowed me to understand the more complex forms. Do you, do you think it's useful as a, as a form of pedagogy to incorporate these historical examples as sort of, um, you know, simplifications of, of what we see in, in contemporary finance? Um, well, I guess I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think so, but I, I, I've had my students tell me that, you know, they didn't really understand some basic financial principles uh, until they were exposed to the hi- history behind them mm-hmm. and uh, the logic of present value calculations and so forth. So uh, at least some of them have told me that um, it's made a difference in terms of their, uh, you know, their, uh, their professional uh, use of these tools. Um, you know, I, I, for me, I'm always interested in where do things come from and, and how, and why they matter. And, uh, I try to focus on the sort of bigger picture of the implications of having these tools. Um, and I think that that's an important thing. You can only get it through history mm-hmm. because it takes time for things to play out. You know, um, you can think about the 1920s. Uh, as an important period in economic history and and how does it relate to the Great Depression and and, and so forth. But um, you cannot do a deep study of of anything in the financial world if you only have three or four years of experience. Um, So so the the trajectory of time is important. Historical models for the consequences of things like securitization are extremely important. And so, um, you know, I tend to think that if you, if you really want to understand the, the big picture, uh, y- you have to look at history. 
And certainly if you're trying to an anticipate, you know, what could go wrong, uh, it's helpful to kind of review some of the, uh, the fiascos that, that have happened, right? Uh, South Sea Bubble, a great example, right? Um, and John Law, fantastic story. Uh, all the bankruptcies. I know in finance, what we'll do is we'll, we'll look at the S&P 500 or we'll look at the U.S. stock market and we'll look at the returns oh, since 1929. We'll say, this is fantastic. But of course, if you, know, if you invested in Rome and you got that kind of return, you, you'd have something that would be, you know, you'd, you'd own the entire universe, right? After investing one, the equivalent of one, one dollar. Um, and so it seems like one of the, the key trends that you see is that the interest rates just have gone consistently down. And you talk about these contracts in Mesopotamia where you'd get 33% a year, or something like, like this, um, is, 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 and that's, that's a trend that, um, seems to be playing out, you know, the last decade or so. We're just continually making things safer and, uh, and, and, you know, figuring out ways to reduce risk. Yeah, it's interesting. We have, um, well, I have a colleague who, who is a postdoc at the Yale School of Management for the last couple of years, uh, Paul Smeltzing, and he's got a paper about 800 years of interest rates. And there's really one, one punchline to it, which is they've gone down. Yeah, right. <laughs> like the very long term trend is is consistently down. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, our theory tells us that's because of the reduction in risk, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, the decrease in the in the in the in the risk of it. And those reductions can come about for different reasons. One of them uh, being just, you know, uh, the ability to sue and, and get the and the, um, you know, the ability to do to do better as a creditor in default. Mm -hmm. uh, another one could be a uh, decline in, in uh, war, destructive wars, but um, you know, some, or changes in inflation, all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what do you do in a circumstance where the rate of interest is really small, unless you take big risks. It, and we find ourselves in that circumstance now, pension funds, uh, endowments, um, you know, these kinds of institutions that are doing great good uh, are faced with the problem uh, of how do they make their put their money to work in such a way as to be able to meet those obligations that they that they want to meet. And um, you know, uh, it's very hard to tell them um, that it, you know bonds are not really helping them very much uh, right now uh, in their portfolio. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned the last last question. Um, you um, you start off the book by saying that the financial view of things is poses a threat often to status quo, right? And that um, there are other ways of that humans can interact and relate to one another that are you know non financial, and this this financial view tends to disrupt them and allow for more anonymity in terms of interaction, allow more kind of intertemporal exchange, more you know, international exchange. Um, do you think we still have that tension? Do you think we still have this, there's a kind of a, a, a resistance to this view? And is this, this, is this financial view of the world sort of an irreversible, uh, an integral part of the way we think of ourselves as humans now? Uh, one word answer is yes, definitely. Um, we've seen throughout history when there are these financial innovations that um, that change the normal uh, order of things, like um, the ability to borrow money from a bank as opposed to asking your relatives to in, in to, to to lend you some money, um, you know, it, it represents sometimes a level of of freedom uh, that or a change in social relationships that uh, can be perceived as as uh, risky. The other thing. Uh, is that even before we had financial technology, so go back, you know, five or 10,000 years, we still had needs for planning and, uh, and risk sharing. Mm -hmm. But those took, um, you know, those took the form of, of social relationships, uh, reciprocity, like, you know, I go out, I kill an antelope, um, but you didn't, and I'll share with you because I know you'll do that when you kill the antelope. So that kind of reciprocity, I think, is is practically hardwired, or possibly very strongly softwired into culture, mm -hmm. 
and expectations of equity. I mean, right now we are going through um, a, a, a period of self-examination by corporations about what their responsibilities are to not just the owners of their um, shares, uh, but also uh, so-called stakeholders, uh, di different uh, aspects of society that their company might have a uh, an influence on. So that that kind of self-examination I see in the context of this mm. um, sort of formal notion of what a corporation does and owes duty to, versus this uh, presumption that um, that uh, people, individuals, and corporate entities. Uh, are expected by society in some sense to share or to um, to try and help make things more equitable. Depends on what you mean by equity and equitable. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're uh, you know, the discourse is going back and forth all the time about this and, and even people trying to invent ways uh, to, 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 um, uh, uh, to um, further what they believe might be equity. Uh, but I, I think it's a very lively uh, debate right now. I hope it. I hope people keep open minds about every dimension of it, um, and um, we'll see what happens. William, thank you so much. It's fantastic. Glad we could have a chat and check this book out. Money changes everything. It's really. I, I think the word would be what tour de force. It's a comprehensive history. <laughs> Kind of, kind of reminded me a bit of uh, Fernand Braudel, you know, really, really big book. Uh, and also this one here, uh, The Origins of Wealth, which is just, you know, has so much cool stuff. Lots of fantastic illustrations and, and stories. Uh, we'll hope to speak to you again soon. Greg, it's been really uh, a terrific uh, conversation. Uh, thanks for inviting me. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.